We're back with Mr. Fence of Florida, Josh Glover, and in this episode what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about communication, organization, and finance, as well as take a tour of Josh's humble home office. All that coming up right now. I'm Mark Olson. Luke Gibson and I have a combined 50 years in construction as fence contractors. In that time, we have both experienced failures and success. We travel the country talking with other contractors who share their experiences in hopes that their stories can make you a more successful contractor. The world headquarters. Hi. See now this looks like a business oh. office. So this is Lauren's office. Hi. How are you? So when we when we first started, we had uh, we had one one office, one computer. So this is our uh, our dining room slash conference room. Every mo Monday morning we have uh, meetings here. All the foremen come up, and once a week we have crews crew members coming here. Um, we got our white board we write everything. So this is what we talked about last year. Our last Monday, we had some issues with crews. Some of those shouldn't be issues, but it's what you, when you're trying to scale and you're starting out with new people, you're just gonna have some of those. Mm -hmm. but, um, throughout the week, as we run into an issue, Lauren and I, either one will write it up here on the board. That way it just jogs our memory for the next Monday. How many times? You guys ran into an issue repetitively because it happened and then you never addressed it that's a that's a desk we started out with that we bought off of facebook and had people deliver it here quick fast and in a hurry we shared it for about three months and then she yeah. tried to kill me a couple times and we had to get her, her own computer it's real important that these folders and racks here that's it's kind of where everything stays organized by itself when a job is sold, then it's given to Lauren. Lauren calls and locates. She checks off everything, makes sure everything's good to go, enters it in QuickBooks. Then it comes to me. It doesn't get put in a folder anywhere. It gets laid on my desk. I go through and review the job, make sure everything makes sense, and order any materials we need for the project. Once the material is ordered, I put it here, and uh, it sits there until it comes in. Once the material comes in, we have a deliveries app on Crew Messenger, which we use. So every day, the shop guy will post on there, these are the deliveries that come in. So I'll take it and I'll move it from here to here. Once the deliveries are here, the shop guy comes here in the morning, every morning, and he takes any folders that are in this rack and goes back to the shop and pulls them. Once he gets those pulled, then he brings it back and puts it right here. And then I know all these projects here, everything's been verified. It's went through the entire office, administrative process, ordering, scheduling, and it's ready. So if it's not there, uh, Lauren loves it whenever I make a mistake and she gets to put something back on my desk and say, hey, you didn't fill this out. And it's the most efficient way to run anything is you don't let anybody circumvent the process because if you circumvent the processes, then you you end up with issues. Yeah, I'm the I'm the most guilty in yeah. our operations. Yeah, it normally is, and in ownership, and the owner will sell something to a buddy or a friend or somebody he knows or whatever, and he'll scratch it down on a piece of paper and try to run it through and say, hey, we need to do this, and then and then get upset whenever locates didn't get called in or materials weren't there or the crews. When it all boils back to the ownership responsibilities, you didn't follow the same processes that you put in place. Yeah. And uh, then wonder why it didn't turn out right. Yep. And all this really just boils down to good communication. Yeah. It doesn't mean communication is not all verbal. No. It can be in a system like this, but getting that information from the field to the management to whomever is important. Nine out of ten problems happen because of communication. Uh, or lack but I'm yeah, real big usually on... Usually lack thereof, yeah on stay in your lane everybody has their own set of responsibilities and they're expected to take care of those responsibilities i don't need a micromanage them if it, she's if back there with the makes dog. it through you and it makes it to me then i assume you may as well just come up here and talk to us lauren we see you back there you're not sneaky come on babe so yeah. you say this was not a crazy idea this is a good idea oh this is fantastic yeah but scary at the time right a little scary a little bit but not too bad yeah. so she was standing right there at the that bar um, I came back when the deal fell through with the company we were going to purchase. I walked in that door and she could see it on my face so I walked through the door. She said, what's the matter? I said, well, we're not purchasing that company. 
and you know, our, just lost all the color out of her face. And she said, oh my gosh, babe, what are we gonna do? And I said, I don't know. All I know is everything's gonna be okay because we're gonna do the best that we can do. And at the end of the day, if it's meant to happen, it'll happen. And if it's not, then we'll, we'll go back to Kentucky. We worked hours upon hours, seven days a week, 12, 14, 16 hours a day. We were fortunate to have uh, Alex Seaborn and Elizabeth Seaborn on our team from the beginning. They do a great job of taking care of their roles in the company. And it all goes back to that. The mentality of the ownership is the whole stay in your lane policy and then having processes. Identify, when, adapt, and overcome too. Yeah, when, go whenever right. you find an issue, <laughs> like, things if, just if a job apart. makes it through from start to finish and when you get to the end, you had these issues, then you go back and you say, okay, well, how do we fix this? Who could, who could take on that responsibility? And it fits into what they're already doing to, double check and make sure this never happens again. Yeah, and then you started the leasing company just as kind of a side gig. Yeah, I did. Some side um, hustle. The problem with starting a new company, and, and I'm sure everybody out there is facing the same thing, if you're starting a new company, is nobody wants to give you any money. We needed a fork truck when we first started out. We couldn't get a fork truck uh, in the company's name because it was less than a year old. Even though we're killing it in QuickBooks, we send them all our financials, they don't care. Because you're, you're, you're a completely separate entity from Mr. Fence. Yeah. You operate your own P&L balance sheet. Yeah. Not tied together in any way, shape, or form other than the use of the name. Yeah, it's completely separate. I think it's just a good idea that we did that uh, because if you had it all mixed in together, you really wouldn't know if this company was doing good or that one was doing good. So we have intentions of eventually starting a uh, another location in Florida couple hours in either direction uh, but if we were to do that we would still run a completely separate company and and list it as a DPA because you can't you can't track it you can't mm -hmm. like what you were talking about it's, uh, that's a problem we're having is we've got three different locations but we can't tell which one is doing the best because they're all tied together yeah we share the employees we all the money comes into one place and so we're looking at ways that we can the other thing that we can't do is we can't incentivize a manager of a specific location if they're just going yeah so if we break that out we can yeah so, so i think the way you've done it is very wise well it takes a little more paperwork but trial and error the, but the leasing company stemmed from inability to get credit and what happened was i ended up just buying that equipment in my personal name um the fork truck and a track hole and a trailer and some other equipment i couldn't leave that on my personal name forever because we've got intentions to buy a house at mm -hmm. some point so i started the leasing company and it's it's an LLC, it's off by itself. And when I set it up and then I I use rocketlawyer.com. I don't know if you guys ever use that, but if you ever need something written up, don't pay a lawyer thousands of dollars. Just go in there and type it up yourself. But I, I did equipment assignments and I signed the equipments from my name to JRG Leasing, set up an account and everything for it, and then I leased that equipment to Mr. Fence of Florida for enough to pay um, the costs and everything. So what happened was I let, I let that run for about six months and the business built some credit and showed some cash flow and things like that. And then I went to a bank, kind of crappy situation because it, even though you're purchasing it from yourself, you can purchase it for either the purchase price or uh, what the equipment is, is valued on. Yeah, fair market value. And then banks will only load 80% of that. So when we moved it over, I had to pay a chunk of change down, but it's great. Because now that company's set up and running, um, getting ready to buy a new personal vehicle, it's also going to go through that company and then lease it back to myself. At least there's things you can do with that company that, that mm -hmm. make that a good accountant can explain all this to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is key. <laughs> Very key. Yeah, we. I'm actually fortunate enough to, uh, with, with Sean and Mr. Fence of Indiana being tied into this company and then Adam and, and Tricorp and some other companies. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have several accountants to bounce things off of. So when I don't technically agree with one, one says, and I just send it to the other ones and say, what do you think about this? And account, accountants aren't always right. No. There's a yeah. big a book like of a code to go look through. Yeah. So you can have so. disagreements. One will say one's okay. And the other one will say, nah, I wouldn't do that. That's one one piece of advice i'll give every new business owner out there is don't don't ever assume just because somebody's an accountant or a banker or whatever that what they say is a gospel uh with we the, had a terrible accountant to start off with we did yeah, the, the, the worst at yeah. the worst 
So even with the, the banking, when we were doing the PPP financing and trying to get the company set up for that, it was originally they were trying to do it off of our financials for last year, which weren't accurate because we started at zero and consistently grew the company for six months. And you're trying to use our, our average tax return. And the bank originally tried to average out the first five months of last year, which was at zero. So when they, they came back with their first uh, amount for the PPP, it was, a, it was about a third of what we actually qualified for. So asking questions, being intuitive, and not taking everything in the gospel, it's a big benefit. Yeah. So. Hopefully you're learning something as we talk with Josh Glover and how he's taken his business from one to three million dollars in a year. One of the things that I've noticed is how they use the tools that they have at hand, such as their home office, and they're not in a big hurry to move out of those um, when those are working for them as is. Uh, creating a good team atmosphere between him and his wife or whomever he has working with him has served him well as, as well. In the next episode, what we're going to talk about is job costing, finance, efficiency and one of the often overlooked items and important items is advertising and how advertising can help you springboard your business as you're starting and managing for that growth so that's coming up in the next episode stay tuned and until next time you have a good dang day